Welcome uh, here at the presentation for the world review of supply chain applications of RFID and sensors in packaging. Um, I'm from the NVC Netherlands Packaging Center. My name is Ger Standhart. We're from the Netherlands, as is obvious from our name. Uh, I will briefly introduce us and our uh, activities, and then I will tell you more about the use of RFID in supply chain applications, and specifically the Pasteur project, a European project, which we have been involved in for the past three years. Uh, our association, we are an association of companies involved in the entire supply chain of packaged products from raw material suppliers to waste management and everything in between. So the packaging um, producers, the packer fillers, the retailers, machine builders, packaging designers, anything that has to do with packaging can be part of our association. It's completely voluntarily. We have about 550 member companies and about 14,000 contacts in the field. I'm going to stand here. Um, our main business as, uh, as an association is in um, finding and spreading information, knowledge, in education, in packaging, and in looking after the interests of our, interests of our uh, members. We uh, educate people on packaging uh, worldwide, not just in the Netherlands. Of course, we have large part of our activities in the Netherlands, uh, but we are involved in e-learning more and more uh, and try to teach everything about everyone about packaging technology. Um, we're not just in uh, education of people that are already working, but we support uh, the chair of packaging design and management in Twente University, actually not too far from Germany. It's close to the German border, where we have a professor that teaches students at the, the university that are now studying industrial design engineering. Uh, most of our uh, activities in to standardization, and uh, I'll have a few examples for that in my presentation as well. Standardizations for RFID, um, environmental standards, I'll have a presentation about that tomorrow. And accessible design uh, is also a very uh, important subject for us nowadays. And I have a short piece about innovation, packaging innovation, uh, our packaging innovation context, uh, contest. Now, you're here for the review, right? So review, rethink, and get ready for the future. Um, I'll start with our packaging innovation contest. Just a few examples quickly go over packaging standardization, spend most of the time on the Pasteur project because the review is part of the Pasteur project, uh, and I'll end with new developments. Now, what is packaging? And I, I'm used to doing this a little bit interactive, so anyone has any ideas what is packaging? What would be a good definition? Protection of the product, very important, yeah. Branding, yeah, that's, that's one. One function of packaging. Anyone else? What do, how do we get the powder from one place to another? If you have a tube, you can blow it through, but we don't have a tube going through our houses, so we need to make it distributable. We use a very abstract definition of packaging. We say packaging is temporarily integrating a product and an external function in order to be able to use the product. And an example, um, you have milk, you have a pack, it becomes a pack of milk, it travels through the supply chain for a while, then when you start using the milk, they get separated, we drink the milk, we throw away the pack. Temporarily, it was integrated into one thing, but it didn't last forever. Um, that's how we look at packaging. Uh, important for us as NVC is that we talk about packaging in English. Packaging can be the noun or the verb. We talk about the activity of packaging. Of course, the item is an important part, but the activity is broader, and we don't want to limit our focus just on 
packaging materials. Now, in other languages, it is more clear, but in English, packaging, packaging. You have pack, package. It, it gives some confusion in, in Dutch. It's verpakken, the activity in verpakking. German, verpakken, verpakung, and uh, some other examples here. Once every two years, we have our packaging innovation contest, and we uh, like to believe it is the most competitive packaging innovation contest in the world. We have 20 jury members that sit for three full days to judge all the contestants. And in the end, there is one winner. We uh, judge both consumer and business-to-business -business packaging. So the packaging you can find in the supermarket, but also the packaging of all the companies that are standing here and using it to ship their ingredients to their customers. And our jury, just like our association, is covering the entire supply chain of packaged products. These are our finalists for this year. Is there, by any chance, anyone that knows who won? The news didn't spread till here yet. We announced it on the 2nd of October. It's not really for ingredients, unless you use the ingredients for your cooking. It's the HAC 1-2 open Closure. It's an easy to open lid for, uh, for a glass jar. Now, I don't think there's anyone here that produces things that are put in glass jars. But this is a revolution. It took them eight years to develop, and it is so simple, you can't believe it wasn't there yet. Two-piece lid. If, if you want to know more about it, I'll tell more about it at four o'clock. Um, Ingredient-like innovations or innovations that might be important for the ingredient world. Um, some of you might know this, this one. It's a bit of a small picture, but it's the, the Gambo Mini Max. It's the small version of the big Gambo system, the big bag that stands without any support. You just fill it and it stands. This is the small version, up to 50 kilos. New production process. The cheese ripening foil um, for, uh, from DSM, and there's some innovative coding in the one there top left, but uh, I won't go too deep into that. I have to talk about RFID here. Um, and that's why I picked this one as a last example from our uh, packaging innovation contest. Just as an example that it's not always consumer products that win. In 2004, we had this, the icon as a winner, uh, the RFID equipped transport container or hopper, um, advanced systems with, uh, with information that enable you to know where your product is, how much you have, what product is where. I promised a little bit about standardization. Um, of course, I don't have to explain everything about all the standards because that's not of interest. The reason I'm telling this is because we have been involved in the standardization of RFID for supply chain applications for more than 10 years now just to show that we know what we are talking about. And this, again, does not just involve applications on consumer packaging because we don't see much RFID on consumer packaging yet. Yes, on Viagra bottles in the, in the United States, because that's one of the exceptions. You see it in uh, fashion, uh, fashion retail a bit, but l very little on, on primary packaging. Most of it is on container and pallet level the higher levels in the, in the standards. Let's talk about the Pasteur project. Three years ago, we started this project with uh, project partners like NXP, Philips, universities from the Netherlands and Belgium, European projects to develop a wireless sensor platform for quality control in the cold chain of the future. It's a proof of technology project, and we are now at the end of the project. We don't have a product that you can buy yet. It's not on the shelf. It is, but we have proven in the project that the technology worked. You can use it to track temperature, relative humidity, and CO2 in the supply chain. We had more ambitious goals. We also wanted to track uh, oxygen and ethylene, but those were bit more difficult. Now, why did we start this project? Um, we all know there are problems in the world with food waste. We are wasting too many of our resources, not just oil, but also the food we produce. Here in the Western world, a lot of it is uh, wasted 
in the supply chain between well in in retail and maybe even at consumers in the third world uh more than 60 well numbers vary 40 to 60 percent is wasted before it comes to the supermarket so that's a very relevant um item to look at we are looking for ways to do something about it and um that's it was the reason to develop the technology behind Pasteur. Um, and the goal for this sensor tag, why do you want to know what happened to your product in the supply chain, what temperatures it was at, is to accurately determine the shelf life. Now we have a very, well, I, I wouldn't call it random, that's, that's, that's too harsh, but uh, the estimation that's now on the packaging in the supermarket is um, on the safe side, let's say, uh, for some products. And for other products, it's way too short. If you take orange juice, for example, uh, and you drink it eight years after the date has passed, it won't kill you. Okay, the, the vitamin C is gone. Um, so we want to have a more precise estimation of the shelf life of the products, optimize the logistic chain, and um, make sure that everything we eat, we consume, is healthy and safe. Most important for that is the temperature. Um, and for several products, like powders, humidity is, is important. We looked at meat, pH, in the, in the slaughterhouse, the, how fast the pH decreases and at what level it ends up is very important for the quality of the meat. Uh, gases like uh, O2 and CO2 for modified atmosphere and ethylene, which is a ripening hormone for fruits and flowers. Of course, at the beginning, we looked at what was available then and at the end of this pre presentation, I will have a look at what is available now. They are uh, temperature loggers, sensors, quite bulky, big, uh, and relatively expensive compared to what we are trying to achieve in the Pasteur project. Um, it says here price range more than $1, but way more than $1. And the official goal of the project is 25 cents per tag. And like I said, it's not on the shelf yet. You can't buy it yet, but we are aiming at the 25 cents. And uh, the sensors for that are a challenge because a normal RFID tag, a simple one, can already be 25 cents. If we look at adoption in the supply chain of uh, RFID, it is growing, uh, but mostly in closed systems. We are still expecting for it to grow in the supply chains that supply chain partners are going to cooperate with each other and start using it together, but that needs the men mentality change to share information. Um, and the item management way after 2015, maybe we'll get there someday. I am not convinced about that myself. We have other coding systems that work fine for that. So, like I said at the beginning, sensor platform, a wireless sensor tag, that's what we're trying to achieve. So we can get all those products through the supply chain and we know what happened to them. Um, in order to test this, we selected a few application cases. Uh, we had a meat case and a fruit case. Um, I mostly look at the, the fruit case here uh, because that makes use of most of the sensors. The meat case was temperature and, and pH. And in uh, the fruit case, we looked at uh, the different quality parameters of the fruits and, uh, and we tried to see if we could measure that in the supply chain. And we did that with this thing. Now this is a schematic. Uh, you can see it has an antenna at the top which is connected to a chip that does RFID communication. It has a printed battery uh, the sensor chip and uh, an extra chip for all the uh, calculations. Uh, and as a backup, we have a connector on, on the side so for the wired readout. This is what it looks like. What it looks like. This is the printed version. Uh, most of it is printed except for the chips that are put in. You can still see the empty spots here. This is what it looks with the chips on it. 
you can see all the parts that I just mentioned in the schematic picture, they are there. And that nice blue field, that is the, the, the part of ink where the electricity cannot go through. Uh, a bit closer look at the sensor tag. Uh, you can see at the bottom of the tag, this is the bottom side, there is a small gap, otherwise the gases don't get to the, the tag and you can't measure anything. Uh, so we had to cut a small hole in every tag in the substrate. And a bit closer up, uh, this is the schematic of the, the, the chip. In the middle, there is the sensing platform where you can put the material that senses whatever you want to sense. This is not for temperature. Temperature is uh, integrated somewhere else in the chip. But this is for the relative humidity and for the gases. So if you look at relative humidity, you get nice readings. We tested it put it in a, in a chamber and then you make the relative humidity go up and down and up and down and it reacts very well just like the, the sensors you can buy now. Uh, we also tried it for CO2 and uh, that, that works as well. You can put different sensors on one chip. Two is easy, four is more difficult. Now, because it's still difficult to print all this, uh, we also made a, a PCB version, a hard tag for the field trials, uh, and it looks like this is, it has the same parts on it again. And we did some tests with that, and this is uh, one of the Pasteur people, he took the tag, he activated it, took it home with him, put it in his fridge, here you see him opening the fridge door, temperature went up, and closed it again, kept it there for a while, took it out, and it measured the temperature uh, going up in the room, and uh, he has a nice, nice and cozy house, about 20 degrees. We did the same for relative humidity, and you see the same spike at the uh, door opening again. And um, this is the presumed rot development. Now, this is not just a graph. This is connected to the quality models that were developed by the universities, because we don't just measure, we also calculate what the consequences of the calculated, uh, of the measured circumstances are. And that uh, is what we need to get to the right shelf life calculation in the end. We also calculate how much weight loss there should be uh, in, in that time considering the circumstances the product was in. So, what are we trying to achieve? Real-time monitoring of the cold chain, not in a way that we can adjust the circumstances uh, because uh, this is not a steering, a, a system that steers the, the conditions in the supply chain, but we want to see what's happening in the supply chain now so we can act now. So if your strawberries are transported at conditions that are a little bit too warm or too moist, then you can decide not to send it to the retailer, but to the juice factory, for example. So uh, in that way, you can still use it before it really gets rotten and it doesn't get wasted. Now, uh, we looked at the beginning, what was available, and I, now at the end of the project, we're looking again at the technology available in the world to already do this. And we found a few solutions that uh, are now available with RFID and temperature sensors. Uh, and this is the first one, the Farsen Solutions uh, Gen 2 Batteryless. Uh, I specifically looked at uh, semi-active and passive tags because the tags that have a big battery on them, they cannot be compared to the Pasteur tag. Uh, it's about the same size, but it's a hard tag, just like our uh, uh, PCB version for the tests. So it's not flexible, you cannot put it in a sticker, but you can stick it on a crate, for example. This one is a little bit bigger and bulkier and more expensive. Uh, it is used um, more in shipping containers uh, and also has a temperature sensor and can be uh, read out uh, with an RFID reader. It's battery assisted, the previous one did not have a battery. Uh, and the company that produces it claims that the battery would survive many years. Now, because we have a printed battery in the Pasteur project, it survives when activated a few weeks. 
because uh, printed batteries are still uh, in development and upcoming. Still needs to be improved. Uh, this is one that does have a printed battery, the uh, Power Temp, TMP, from Power ID. Now, I'm not entirely sure if anyone uses it yet, but it's been on the market for a while. And this actually comes very close to what we have as a Pasteur tag, only it has only a temperature sensor and a battery, um, and no, uh, no other sensors. Here's another hard tag again uh, that has been used in a Belgium project, similar to the Pasteur project, uh, also with a temperature sensor, and you can um, decide on the measuring interval you want to use. In Pasteur project, that's also uh, available. We decided that usually you want to measure around 10, 15 minutes um, intervals uh, to to get your uh, uh, measurements, your information. And uh, it, this has a normal battery inside again, and that makes it last for a few years. And uh, the last example, um, at the beginning, if you look closely, you saw a Sensi SensiTag application as well. They have one with a USB uh, connection on it, uh, but nowadays uh, they also have one that can be read out Wirelessly, wirelessly, again, only relative, uh, only temperature. Now, I have found chips that have other sensors on it, uh, but I have not found tags with the, the functionality of more than just temperature sensors. And in the end, we have our Pasteur tag. So, um, just to make a comparison, all of them can measure temperature, um, humidity, and gas is not commercially available yet. Um, Semi-flexible or completely flexible is just the, the Power TMP from uh, Power ID and the Pasteur tag, and the same goes for the printed batteries. Because I, I guess that is because the printed batteries don't last long enough for these systems to go through the entire supply chain. Because if you want to t bring your bananas from, uh, where do they usually come from? South America. Colombia, I think, most of them, to the Netherlands or Germany, it takes a few weeks, I think, and then you're not at the end of your supply chain yet. So that's one of the challenges still for the Pasteur project. Now, concluding, um, the benefits for a smart sensor tag can be found in the entire supply chain of, uh, of packaged products. Um, but the information will have to be shared between the, the steps of the chain. Uh, it fulfills a need. Um, many governments are now focusing on preventing uh, food waste. Um, and more and more companies and retailers are, are joining. Um, but at the moment, um, it is unclear um, if the Pasteur solution will ever become commercially available. Uh, there is a chance that the, the pharmaceutical world will adopt it sooner than the food industry. Because uh, especially in the, the fruits and vegetables, the margins are under pressure. New developments, well, I already mentioned food loss. Uh, intelligent modeling, it's part of the Pasteur project, but you see it more and more. Uh, not just measuring, but also modeling and calculating. Uh, we see it in testing, we see it in, uh, in supply chain uh, models. Printable electronics is really on the rise. Um, I don't know how long it's going to take before we don't need silicon anymore for uh, electric circuitry. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure the people at NXP don't want to think about that too much. But it is coming and it is uh, improving. And sustainability, um, well, it will not stay a trend for long because it will become common practice. Now, um, this information and a lot more information about RFID and the supply chain and how it works and what the developments are, we have included in our world review, uh, which we made with uh, Michael Guillory from America, from uh, Strategic Action Consulting Services, and it will be available uh, from next week, if you want, you can uh, send me an email 
or fill in the form that my colleague uh, Sherissa Cola, uh, Cola brought, uh, brought with her. Um, and then we will send it to you. It's a digital report available free of charge. And I would like to thank you for your attention and uh, have a good exhibition.